Okay, so today's the anniversary, the one year anniversary of the anti-homeless fence. And this fence was put up, um, and the, the woman that you see with her hands up there, she was one of the people that was uh, demanding that we be eliminated from here, the homeless get out of here. And this is her original uh, statement that she wrote to the Sentinel, a letter uh, calling to take back Santa Cruz from the homeless. And um, that actually is a very old letter, but we received lots of information that she was advocating that the city and the post office put up this fence to try to keep people from eating here and being here, and they did this told stories about defecation, and there's litter, and all that. And so, we um, have had, we are doing a celebration called the Anti-Homeless Fence Decorating Party, and that's happening uh, all day today. So the thing about this fence, which is interesting, I think, is that they put, they put it up when Donald Trump, you know, has only been in office like a couple of months, and Donald Trump is going. We're gonna, you know, uh, build walls, and then we have walls between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and we have walls, and there's even metaphorical walls that were built from under the Trump administration, and one of those meta walls is the walls of the liberals in Santa Cruz hating the people living on the streets, not willing to pay to make sure people have adequate health, uh, shelter, health care, and all those things. They want to keep all their money themselves for their condominiums. And I appreciate working hard to, you know, the, this woman was a school teacher um, for years, and she had to try to survive on a pension with her husband who runs a barber shop. And so uh, that's like an amazing thing. Hey, Blue, come here. You gotta get in the. Uh, so Blue has been a uh, stalwart for over all, uh, almost exactly a year. He's been out here every week helping Food Not Bombs. And uh, why don't you tell him, Blue, what happened last week when you were cooking? Was it last week when you were cooking with Food Not Bombs? <coughs> what happened? You asked me if I needed a job. I said yes. He said you need housing. I said yes. I said, come with me. We walked down to the garage at, at Malabar, and I got hired. And yesterday, they raised $2,100 for my housing fund. $2,100. Nice. It's going to be put in a trust. My, my friend who's, uh, no, my, my care worker or at the homeless shelter, Vivian, is keeping it in a, in a trust. And uh, hopefully it's a recurring interest. Right. Because... Um, I'm not going to just take the first little uh, dwelling that happens. I want to find the right one. And um, whew, Isn't that amazing? it was amazing. Amber yeah. Rose was there. Yeah. Abby and was there. To Keith, Keith, uh, Keith. She came back and she says, ah. Oh. Oh, cool. And then my friend Regina, uh -huh. who I've known for about 40 years. Right. Um, a lot of people. And then one lady goes, why aren't you coming out? I go, I got, this is the wash. <laughs> that beautiful. You have your kids that far? Yeah. Well, I, you know, the funny thing is, uh, Raj was running out in front of his restaurant down at the corner of SoCal, screaming, yeah. yelling at these guys walking by. And I thought, well, maybe they robbed him. So I said, what happened, Raj? Did they rob him? Rob you? And he said, no, no, I'm looking for somebody that's reliable that can uh, work for me and I'll give him a place to live. And I said, I have an idea who <laughs> could do that. Well, and then reliable. you were so funny because you were like saying, um, you just so calmly asked if I needed a place to live. He said, Yes. Not a big deal. <laughs> and you go, he asked and you so received yeah, it. So it manifested it, right? Yeah, it's so beautiful. So are we finished with this woman over here or what? Well, the, yeah, basically the, the woman has run its campaign to try to get rid of people living on the streets for years. And um, and what part of her effort is the this anti-homeless fence. But then what happened was... They said we were leaving all of our paper plates and everything around, which we never do. And so they got frustrated, so they had to dump trash out here and take pictures of it, make a petition demanding that we be uh, removed from here. And now they're to the point where the local politicians won't, like we get to uh, the uh, internal letters, you know, between her and the politicians. And they're like, we're not meeting with you anymore. That's enough. This is not, we're not getting rid of people. We've already spent like tens of thousands of dollars on a fence that didn't get rid of anybody. It became a, a fence that we decorate now. 
And, uh, Gosh, it's ugly. It looks like it's a prison. Yeah, and this is a bit. It's like another wall. Right, and this is the oldest uh, continually used uh, post office in California. And it has these amazing uh, murals from the Great Depression inside by a woman that died uh, penniless in San Jose. But she, uh, and she got something like $400 for these murals in there during the, during, uh, the 30s. That was a historical building? Huh? Historical building? It's a historical building with historical... So the building is, uh, is uh, around the time of World War I. And then the murals are, uh, were paid for as part of the... Uh, not technically the Works Projects Administration, but like that kind of idea of CCC and stuff. Well, it sounds like they honor someone who was a starving artist, maybe? Yeah. It was yeah. Needed money? Probably didn't have. Was yeah, she, she was homeless. Like, yeah, she wasn't homeless, but she was very poor. She lived in this area, Monterey, and it was a way of employing all the artists in the country so that they could live. And the post office honors that, and then they want to. Then well, they're trying to get rid of the the homeless themselves. And the crazy <laughs> thing is that the uh, the story was that Portuguese Tony yelled at somebody after the postal employees came out and took all of his belongings and he was angry about it. And so they said it was too scary when when uh, Portuguese Tony yelled at them. And then, but Portuguese Tony's in jail now, because he, otherwise he'd be here. And um, the last time he went to jail, the time before the current time he's probably in jail, is he was washing his clothes in the fountain and he, uh, the, the government, uh, you know, the people from the park Pardon? department started screaming at him, you're not allowed to do that. And he goes, I fought in the war for our country. I'm a veteran. I, like, defended your right to be here. And you tell me I can't, like, wash my clothes in the fountain? That's crazy. And then he acted, yeah, like, six weeks in jail for that, man. Wow. That's crazy. Hey, uh, uh, bring us to closure. Uh, Keith uh, McHenry. I, uh, no, I'm Keith McHenry, one of the co-founders of Food Not Bombs, and we will be celebrating the 38th anniversary here. Um, yeah, we're going to do Soup Stock 2018, the last Saturday of May. There you go. Thank Ooh. you very much. So I've got an additional question here because uh -huh. I, I found the uh, um, uh, online. You see, see, there's a tweaker picture with a yeah, and that's sick. That's what is that? Okay, so it turns out that two uh, <laughs> two skateboard companies that hate the homeless, and they probably were broken into by people they believed were tweakers, um, started publishing those um, bumper stickers and putting them on. Uh, all around town. So more or less it's a reaction to a break-in? Uh, that's my sense, because where their stores are, there have actually been a few break-ins. Who knows whether the people living on the streets or not, but you know, it's impossible to tell. And, um, but you know, in this situation, um, you know, the odd thing is that, that you know, uh, meth was really a creation of the Nazis to help uh, their soldiers fight on the, right. against the Soviet Union. going for days Union. without sleep, yeah. yeah. And now it's a really popular bunch of uh, neo-Nazis around the world are really into it. That's like a Yikes. huge thing. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a, and And so it's kind of this crazy thing that here you have this people that are basically using the same ideology as the Nazis and Mussolini and them going after people living on the street just categories. So one of the things I have done, which you can see, is that go along, you'll see uh, these um, triangles, black triangles on the fence. And so the beginning, uh, I have uh, uh, known a couple of people that survived the Holocaust um, or were, you know, were Protestant or Catholic in Germany during the Holocaust. And so we're probably not subject to being killed. But they um, all point out that there became all this language of the homeless defecating on urinating on the streets. We've got right. to get rid of them. Oh, uh, yeah, and so the, well, the first Two of the first groups of people rounded up were um, people living on the streets. And there was a lot of people in Germany living on the streets because of um, the economic crash. People might remember seeing like old footage of people carrying wheelbarrows full of dollars rushing to the store to buy a loaf of bread, you know. Um, so there was a lot of poverty and chaos, and so a lot of people lived on the streets. And then the other group of people that were rounded up were people that were um, mentally ill, and they actually uh, um, I don't know if you recall the White Rose, but the White Rose was a group of uh, young people in uh, Germany who went out and did graffiti and flyers against Adolf Hitler. And they became interested in that because one of, there was a brother and a sister 
and their mother worked at a mental hospital and they were telling them, look at, you know, my patients are being gassed. That's what that smell is that you smell in town. And the uh, brother actually survived being on the, uh, fighting the um, Soviet Union and had come back and was like, you know, German, Hitler saying we're winning, we're winning, we're winning, but we, I was there, I saw it with my own eyes, we were brutally losing. And so the combination of that uh, brought them together and they ended up being um, killed. Uh, they got captured um, when they were found and they were super careful. They did things like take their typewriters apart and move them around and then reassemble them with different um, keys so that the no two flyers and were typed the same yeah. and stuff like that and they still eventually got caught. And that, um, that group was a huge influence in my being an activist is, um, and why I've done I, one of the main things I started out doing was graffiti all over uh, Boston and, and uh, wheat pasting uh, flyers and stuff. And my graffiti was influenced by a woman bit named um, Dr. Helen Caldicott. And I happened to see her standing on a milk crate at the Boston Commons talking about all this stuff going on with the um, uh, intercontinental nuclear missiles towards each other and uh, what was going to go on and how horrible that was if there was a nuclear war. And so I made a stencil of a mushroom cloud with the word today question mark and I spray painted that all over um, Boston. And that became a, a movie called Sidewalk Sector. They filmed, uh, did a whole analysis of why street art versus corporate art. And um, it became a play called Murder Now. And a young man from the town where my grandfather uh, retired to came and he didn't know me or anybody and he traced a copy of one of the stencils uh, on, a, on a wall, went home and made more stencils and he spray painted it all over his town until he got um, caught and expelled and had to do a senior year in high school twice because of it. So this is like one graffiti thing. Just, uh, and then I did dead bodies where friends would lay on the ground, I'd chalk them. And if there was a massacre in El Salvador, we would go to a big plaza, try to chalk as many dead bodies as we could compared to the massacre, and then I'd spray paint them white so they'd stay there. And there was always Ask the Globe was a thing, and the chief of police said, oh yeah, we put white outlines to uh, when people die on the streets. And, and you do, they said, well, just there are 38 white outlines in front of the library that I don't remember reading about a massacre in front of the library. And the chief of police says, yes, we do put white lines around dead people. <laughs> kind of confirming, <laughs> accidentally, yeah. that there was a massacre. Yeah. It wasn't right there, it was somewhere else. <laughs> but well. by the same people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, anyway, so the White Rose was really influential uh, in my, you know, I've always had, uh, been as, I was born in Germany, in West Germany, actually, technically, and, and I had an affinity to Germany anyway because of mm. that. Mm. Than knowing about their story. How'd you feel about the Berlin Wall coming down? It was that, that like was that was great, and I was over there not long after, and it was a really fun meeting. I met the two food up bombs that didn't know each other, one in East Germany in Alexanderplatz, and one in uh, and, and Kronzberg or whatever the other neighborhood is, the Turkish neighborhood. And uh, one was a bunch of Polish kids, and the other were uh, you know were German kids, and I was like, wow, they didn't. I got to connect them both together. To, you realize that they were only a few blocks away, really. I mean, yeah. not that far. Well, wasn't that supposed to be the beginning and the end where everything was going to start going right? Oh, yeah. It was the end of wars. It was uh, everybody was going to be rich. Um, yeah. When they were going to work. Water. I know. And then when uh, and my friends put out a... Uh, those kids were part of a group that put out a magazine called Abolish the Borders from Below. And they came to an agreement that everybody would... Uh, submit their articles in English, that that was, turned out to be the more common language. And it was for all the Eastern Bloc as the chaos was unfolding right at the end of the Berlin Wall. And so there's beautiful stories of Funat bombs like, um, you know, ship taking over buildings in, in, in Poland and, wow. and uh, how the group started in Serbia and during the war, what they were doing during the war. Pretty amazing. Yeah, so, so that's so abolish the border from below kind of goes with the whole thing today of, you know, walls. 
a burly wall came down. There was walls between people and, and economic, uh, you know, whether you're communist or, or capitalist and all that. And now look where we're at. And the interesting thing I've learned from the, spending a lot of time in, in uh, Eastern and Central Europe is the governments that came to power were essentially the same people that ran those governments when they were communists. They just became just became democratic and, right? yeah, yeah. and they were just as corrupt and everything the same spy apparatus everything nothing really changed but the name yeah, well, yeah. Shit, we, we were funding all that stuff for uh, you know all the, all the war effort to begin with selling weapons and then hopefully there'll be less people so we can exploit them that much easier yeah 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 it's really crazy and the, and the poverty and you know, a lot of people are freaked out, uh, and particularly in the former Soviet Union, you know, because of, uh, you know, they had a basic income, and, you know, it might not be great, but they had housing, they had, I've been in a lot of those communist houses, they're kind of cool in a way, they're ugly, but they're very well designed, so they're all, they had a model of exactly the same designs, because modular, and they might be 20 stories high, and they're like hundreds of 20 story high buildings, but what, there's so many cool things I loved about it. They um, had like, uh, why don't we, we, you never see this in the United States, but if you wash your dishes in, a, in one of those buildings, and you put all your dishes up in the rack above it, there's wires on the bottom, so you don't take your dishes, put them in a drying rack, and then lift them up into the, into the uh, cupboard. The cupboard's a drying rack itself. Right. And then they have like a... Yeah, and then the washing machines that are, it was like insane, that, that oh. were like so convenient, everything was like Gosh. really organized. Have, have you seen it? actually being a human living, it was like a really convenient. Do you uh, all know about food not bombs? Oh, I thought they were looking. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, have you seen those, those spaces that are I mean, like 100 square feet or whatever, but they got like a whole three bedroom house in, in that one, and everything folds up. And, yeah. You know, I know, and then here we let people live in those streets. And, by the millions, you know, and, and, and harass, so there seems to be an increased harassment here. I don't know if you started talking to people, but after they set up the boneyard um, campsite, they, um, you know, they rested at what, 28 people, like the next day, they are just living outside. For, for just being outside. Well, they would get like a warrant, or, they'd get, or littering, or things like that. Right. And then, um, they just, like, kept, it's an insane, the amount of, uh, you know, people are really complaining that it's a real drag. They're being well, that, that's, around. <coughs> that, that's the monitoring part of the declaration because supposedly they're... Oh, we're, we love homeless now. Yeah, yeah, I know. That, emer how, that an emergency shelter crisis thing. At like, 90000 a month? Yeah. Are you kidding me? So they have like a little campground um, where you can't go unless you go by their transportation. You know? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a mini jail cell. Yeah. I mean, that's what it seems that's like a holding true. tank. Yeah, and you have to be vetted, and, uh, you know, you can't be a... Yeah, owned and operated. Yeah, it's really <laughs> crazy. Well, did you sign up for services yet? Yeah, and then, oh, the, what, I know, and then the, for the chief of police is saying, well, now, it takes uh, many times before people will agree to go get services. Right, oh, you know, the services that don't... <laughs> exist. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and surrender to what? J just saying that, that we'll wait for you and hold our breath? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's stupid. Everybody knows you can sign up for a housing voucher and wait th three years and then be kicked off of it. They'll okay. go do another 20 million and then get back on and then get kicked off. And what, what do you feel? What do you, uh, what do you know about the rent, rent control measure they're trying to get passed? Um, I think that's a good thing. They have the look rent at all freeze. Amish, man. Come back home but, and look at Amish. But look at he does look Amish. Amish. <laughs> <laughs> Come back home and look at Amish. So, um, yeah, so I think, and, if, and particularly if the state law changes, which is a real <laughs> pressure to try to get the, because uh, there was all these restrictions on, on rent control um, at a state level, and there's a big push for a proposition to uh, eliminate that, all those restrictions. Because it would just be so few houses and apartments um, under the current law that would qualify if our rent control in Santa Cruz passes. But the thing is that it's um, what's kind of shocking is that the board of supervisors, which are not or city councilors, which are not known for doing anything right, all voted unanimously for a rent freeze. So that the um, because there was like uh, even though it was under the radar, people are already jacking up rents by huge amounts, saying, oh, there's going to be a rent control, so we're raising your rent by 
three hundred bucks a month. And there's no way Section is going to keep up with that. No, no way at all. No. And then all the stuff that Trump's proposing. If any of that happens, with um, you know, with all the cuts and stuff and services and food and food and stamps and being nothing breaks. but a ba yeah, <laughs> yeah food stamps being food. a box of food and stuff like that. Thing I don't feel like we think that the three four million people living on the street now is a lot. It's going to be in the tens of millions.